It's happening in eighth grade. How you guys doing today? Well, sitting outside in the backyard, the sun's out. Trees are green. But we're still on quarantine. Well, here's my next lecture for you guys, and uh, it's on section 15.3-ish and 15.2-ish and 15.1-ish. And we're talking today about hardships and weapons and some strategies of the Civil War. Now, when we first talk about the hardships, I want to just cover one main thing, which wasn't really in your books, but it's kind of cool. And it has to do with prisons. Yeah, prisons. Prisons in the Civil War. So you say to yourself, well, what did they need prisons for? Well, where did they put the soldiers that they captured during the war? Well, let's talk about that. When either side would capture a soldier, they would take him to a prison. For the first two years, the soldiers were brought to the prisons. They stayed there for maybe a week or two weeks. Then they were actually brought back to the front lines and handed over to the side that they were from, which was kind of crazy. It's like, I think I would have rather stayed in a prison because chances are I would have survived. But... That's what they do. They would just have this exchange of soldiers. Um, in 1862, they came up with this great idea. They had this prisoner exchange program, and it was done by Dixon Hill. Dix from the South, Hill from the North. And they created this cartel, which was a program um, of exchange, and it was kind of a joke. Uh, the location, the number of soldiers, um, what rank they were, and uh, the whole exchange was really not fair and kind of like wrong. The parties that needed the armies the most obviously benefited from the exchange. Now, they had this great exchange, and it kind of like turned into a race issue because... In 1860, when Lincoln put in the emancipation, was it 60? Oh, excuse me, 1863. In 1863, when Lincoln uh, institutes the Emancipation Proclamation, he allowed black soldiers to actually enter the war. So now you have the black soldiers who were captured as prisoners and who were in the South and those who were in the North, you, you had a problem with the exchange now because the South refused to give up a black soldier believing the fact that a black soldier was an escaped slave. Therefore, that was their property, so they're not giving them back. The North, however, would not give back their guys because they didn't care whether you were white or black, but if you were a black, say, sergeant in in the black army the black side of the army they wanted a white sergeant in exchange and so the whole exchange idea just went out the window and the prisons themselves became so overcrowded with with prisoners obviously um that the prisons became just this hotbed of death from disease and and other things now what they did realize was that they needed to build prisons. And where were they going to get these prisons from? Well, when you look at the fact that there were over 400,000 excuse me, prisoners, they, they decided to create prisons based on three factors. The defensibility of a prison. Was it defensibility? Was it strong? Was it fortified, uh, coming from the uh, base fort, uh, and safe from the south or north trying to come in and, and, and take over? They wanted to know, was the prison's location accessible to good resources? Well, I don't know. What kind of resources do they need? Water, food, growth, you know, so defensibility, 
resources, and transportation. Could they transfer prisoners in and out of the prisons safely and economically? Well, the South kind of gave up on the idea of the whole exchange and then the North as well. But what happened was the North needed to create prisons. The South put a lot of these guys to work on the plantations. But in the North, they had to create prisons out of different places. So they decided to create them out of forts, old buildings, um, fairgrounds, old racetracks. Now, this brings out a really funny and, and kind of, um, I guess, a, a little bit of history that most of us don't understand and don't know. But if you look at the most popular Civil War prison, it was on Bellas Island in New York, right on the New York Harbor. This was actually the first fort built. Well, not the first, but it became a fort during the War of 1812 and later became what they known as Fort Wood. Now, when we're looking at the New York Harbor, what sits in New York Harbor today? Yes, I know bodies from the the people uh, that's that's in the that's in the Hudson River, but where, what sits in New York Harbor today? Well, it's the Statue of Liberty. So during the, the Civil War, Fort Wood was a fortified fort that was used as a prison. After the war was over, after the Civil War ended, they filled in that fort with cement and dirt and everything, and it now sits as the base of the Statue of Liberty. So if you ever go visit the Statue of Liberty, or if you have already, you were actually standing on a prison during the Civil War known as Fort Wood. Wonderful. That's really kind of cool, right? Okay, so when we look at the prisons and, and how a lot of these prisons were the hotbed of death, uh, m most of these deaths were, were from dysentery, uh, smallpox, and gangrene. Well, gangrene. Well, a lot of these soldiers died from gangrene, from bullet wounds, um, from surgeries that, of course, during that time, they had no idea that they had to have clean uh, surgical tools. Um, <clears throat> so disease and bacteria and everything killed these guys more so than the bullet wound itself. Now, we'll get into weapons in a little bit. Um, prisoners tried to escape. Well, if you think about Alcatraz Island, it was probably easier to get out of Alcatraz than it was to get out of one of these Civil War prisons. Um, this prison system was practic practically impossible to get out of. Uh, there were about 56,000 deaths in total during the whole Civil War. So, thinking more about the whole Civil War and the weaponry of the Civil War, you, you think back of the Revolutionary War. Well, the Civil War utilized the same muskets, the Flintlock musket, uh, the, the, the pour the gunpowder in, pack it down, boom, shoot. Well, that musket went on for for many years into the Civil War. But before we get there, we have to talk about the North's accessibility to the ability of creating new weaponry. Uh, factories became the hotbed for creating new weaponry. And believe it or not, our good friend Eli Whitney and his invention, do you remember what he invented besides the cotton gin? That's right, it was interchangeable parts. But due to interchangeable parts, they were able to go on and create so many muskets for the Civil War, not only uh, for, for the North, but also the South. The South was able to get them. Now, when you talk about the musket, you know, if you take a look at a picture of it, the, the musket shot a round ball. The rate of fire on a musket was you could shoot three rounds a minute and the range was about 100 yards. Okay, the ball was very inaccurate as it came out of the gun. Eventually, and they came up with 
rifling, even though rifling was around during the Revolutionary War, the idea of rifling, rifling was when they would put spirals inside the barrel of a gun. Now, this had to be done by hand during the Revolutionary War, but as time went on in the factories in the North, they started to rifle the barrels of the musket so that the ball, as it came out of the gun, wasn't bouncing around so much and became more accurate. Um, rifling has been around forever, and one of the things that they realized was that perhaps the ammunition they were using, the ball, needed to be changed as well. So the second big change of, the, of, of weaponry in the Civil War was going from the ball to a cone-shaped bullet. You know, if you look at it, it it's like when, when Eli Manning would throw a football, it would be a beautiful, beautiful spiral, unlike, you know, most quarterbacks in the NFL. But spiraling, the ball was able to spiral and be more accurate. They took this bullet with the cone shape and were able to actually create a more accurate bullet. So now what this did is it stopped linear formations. Do you know what linear formations are? If you think about linear formation and you think of the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, you think of armies standing 100 yards apart facing each other and as one guy, one line shoots and then squats down the line behind them has already loaded they shoot they squat down the third line shoots they squat down and then it repeated both sides are doing this this created such heavily death and whoever came up with linear formation and fighting i guess they wanted to embark you know bombard an area with balls and, and bullets so that they could create great death and great problems so big big change in big change in in the way the actual formations of of battles were fought second biggest or excuse me the third biggest change in weaponry during the civil war was the henry rifle tyler henry created this rifle that now could shoot 30 i believe it was 30 rounds per minute and it was good for a thousand yards so now i didn't have to stand 100 yards away from you to shoot you i could shoot from a thousand yards away he created 13,000 of these rifles and gave them to the north and south south had some of them but the henry rifle changed the way the wars were fought another one was the cannon the cannon if you think about the cannon during the revolutionary war it was a muzzle loaded cannon much like you know the 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 musket you had to take the 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 ball and you shoved it into the front of the the barrel and then packed it down and same like the musket you had to get a cap and light it pack it and shoot it well with the, a regular cannon was good for about three rounds per minute and good for about two thousand yards which which you know isn't very accurate and to get that 2,000 yards even 3,000 you had to launch it at a high angle you know high arc on almost like a Dr. J jump shot okay but if you as they went on they were able to get from the French these cannons that were able to shoot more rounds and they actually were backloaded cannons that were accurate up to 6,000 yards so that they also used cone conical shaped shells rather than ball shaped shells last big thing about weaponry during the civil war were the turrets okay now if you think of, of the wars afterwards you know world war ii and when they were you think about um pilots and flying planes there was always the ball down at the bottom of the plane with a guy with a machine gun in there going right and that turret would spin around okay well what the what they did was and it's pretty amazing was the union uh, the monitor ship this all had to do with the, the 
the navies of the, of the Civil War. The Monitor versus the Virginia, the, the two big, the one big battle was the Monitor versus the Virginia. The Monitor built a turret on their ship and allowed a machine gun, which we'll get to, a, a gun, repeating guns coming out of that turret. And they still had, you know, cannons coming at them. And then the Monitor, being the most fiercest ship of all, had to fight and they faced off against the Virginia. Now, the Virginia was a ship, um, was an ironclad. They, they took this ship from the bottom of the water, right, that had sunk, that had been sunk. And they pulled it out and they created like um, this iron around this ship. It made it huge. Almost like if you look at a rhino, right, a rhino's got the, 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 you look at it and it looks like it has this shield on it. Well, they took this ship out of, out of death and took it, created these shields on it, and the Virginia and the Monitor fought this battle in the ocean for, for time, for a long time, and uh, quite, quite a great battle of the Civil War. Now, when we're looking at the five most lethal weapons of the Civil War, these are the five most lethal. You had the Springfield rifle, which was kind of like the, the, the musket, over a million of those created. Then you had their Henry repeating rifle, right? Then you had the Lamont pistol revolver. Again, this revolver was it was a handheld revolver. It, I believe it had nine. I'm not sure nine rounds in it, but you know, being able to go from a musket to a revolver in your hand, great. And then there was the Napoleon gun. The Napoleon gun was not a gun; it was a cannon, and that's the one that they got from the French. And they were very lightweight, so they were mobile. And then lastly, the biggest one, I think, was the Gatlin gun. The Gatlin gun was that machine gun that you cranked and it just shot away. So, so those are some of the biggest things of weaponry in the Civil War. Now, when we're talking about uh, Bloody 1862, we talked about that's one of our sections. Long, okay, Lincoln, right? Lincoln orders all soldiers in 1862 to move on all four, on all fronts of the South. Now, in the East... General McClellan moved slowly, defying kind of Lincoln's odds, okay? Then in the West, in Kentucky, you had George Thomas, and he had this huge victory at Mill Springs, right? Those are great, great victories in capturing Forts Henry and Donaldson, Donaldson in Tennessee, okay? Those were great victories for the North in, in the South area. Now, when we talk about further things, okay, we're talking about... Shiloh, okay, Shiloh, Shiloh was was a big battle, and that was Grant, that was Grant, Ulysses Grant, he was looking to, to really take over in that area, and you have to understand, at this point, uh, with, with Lincoln's uh, command to take all fronts, the Union Army had created, had gathered 100,000 miles of Confederate land, okay, well, Grant, Grant was moving into Shiloh. McClellan, with his armies uh, of the Potomac, was trying to capture Virginia. And he took on them. He, his That was called the Peninsula Campaign in the east, in Yorktown and Williamsburg. Eventually, which would lead him to meeting up with Southern General Joseph Johnson. Joseph Johnson, however, was wounded in one of the battles. And unfortunately for the Union Army, Robert E. Lee was promoted to the general of the Virginia Army, which made a huge difference for the South. Okay, at the same time, Stonewall Jackson, you guys do know why they're called Stonewall Jackson, because he would stand by a fence and he was be at Stonewall, and he, you know, his face was, and Stonewall Jackson was occupying the Shenandoah Valley, um, but he didn't stay in one area. Stonewall Jackson would go here and there and over there and here and there, and he was winning in these battles, and this was screwing up, excuse me, was confusing um, the Union forces because McClellan didn't know where, where they were coming from. The strategies confused the Union and led Lincoln to make one more important move, and this was inducing the Emancipation Proclamation, all right? Because he did not know if the South was winning. Now, Robert E. Lee captured Harper's Ferry. Remember Harper's Ferry? John Brown went down there. And uh, 
he unfortunately splits his troops, and this caused the bloodiest battle at Antietam. And um, the Confederates kind of, you know, you know, retreated, but 23,000 people died at the Battle of Antietam, and it was considered a draw. So who won that? 23,000 people definitely didn't win that. So soon after the South um, movements and victories, Lincoln institutes the Emancipation Proclamation, which allows the slaves and blacks, free blacks in the North, to join the armies. And as we talked about earlier, you know that. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's our little thing. Uh, Gettysburg is coming up in Chapter 16. Um, I would be ready for a quiz, possibly uh, on Friday, and uh, look for that uh, Friday morning. Uh, I do have office hours tomorrow, Mondays and Thursdays, from 9.30 to 10.30. I know you might be in a, one of them math Zoomerinos, but uh, drop in, ask a question. Um, Come and see your face, and uh, I hope you're all well. Enjoy your day, and uh, stay safe. God bless you guys.